Hello, sweethearts. I'm coming on to read one more Christmas story, and this will be it till probably after Christmas, maybe. But this is a story I think is pretty important. Um, we like to teach children humility and understanding and love for their fellow human beings, um, people they come in contact with. Uh, you never know what somebody else is facing until you've been there yourself. And sometimes we take for granted our world is rosy and there's people whose world's not rosy. And that is when we need to be able to show kindness to them. And it's not giving a, the beautiful presents and things like that. Sometimes it's the more simpler things that they need that are in our ability to be able to provide. And sometimes it's just an ear to listen or whatever the need is. Just we need to teach our children how to get back to the world they're in and to have humility for their fellow human beings. All right. This story is called The Christmas Candle. And it's by Richard Paul Evans. And I have all of his books that he has wrote. And he's got some beautiful, beautiful stories out there. But this one I think is a really special. All right. Let's get to it. On a snowy Christmas Eve, a young man made his way along a dark, deserted cobblestone street. His name was Thomas, and he was wrapped in a woolen cloak. A knapsack flung across his back. In his hand hung a tin candle lantern. Behind the lantern's glass panes sat the remains of a spent candle. When he saw the glow of the candlelight through the shop window of the Chandler, the village candle maker, he hurried his steps, turning into the snow-covered pathway. In Thomas's way stood a beggar, shaking his cup for coins. Thomas pushed him aside impatiently and opened the door to the shop. Inside the shop, metal pots filled with tallow and beeswax hung from a stone hearth. The old Chandler stood with his sculpture's tools in his hands, surrounded by the beautiful creation he had made out of wax. I'm lucky to find you here, Thomas said. The town is empty. The old man gazed silently at Thomas as the young man glanced about at the rows of sculptured candles. There were spites and fairies and angels and see-through wings and fragile princesses in gowns as delicate as lace. They smell of mirth and frankincense and meadow flowers. You are a foolish old man, Thomas said. You spend hours making beautiful things that devour themselves. How long before the flames melt an angel into an ugly clump of wax? He pointed to a row of simple candles. I only need light, and I'll only take one of those. The Chandler looked steadily at Thomas. The Christmas candles are of no good to you. Thomas was startled by the stern response, but he laughed. It would do me. Much good not to stumble in the dark. Are you playing with me, old man? I will not pay more for your candle than it's worth. It's only four coppers, but you may find it costly. The old man's words were strangely serious. I have money. Give me the candle, Thomas shouted. It is late and my family is waiting for me. I need illumination to find my way. Then it is the illumination you desire, the Chandler asked softly. That is what I need, Thomas replied. The old candle maker nodded slowly. So you do. He took a candle and dipped it over a flame and placed it inside the lantern's tin frame. Thomas dropped some coins onto the counter and walked to the door. The old man perched his lips in an odd, amused smile. Merry Christmas, my brother, he said. The farewell surprised Thomas. To you as well, he stamped. Then he hastily stepped into the darkness, the lantern lighting the road ahead. Thomas had traveled only a short distance when a shadow emerged from the alleyway. A robber, he thought fearfully. 
He held out his lantern. Who's there, he called. Then in the light of the candle, he saw it was only a frail woman huddled against the snow and cold. Sir, cried the woman, a pence, please. He narrowed his eyes in contempt at the beggar. Then he looked at her more closely, and he gasped. He knew that face well. It was his own mother. Mother, what is this prank? Do you greet me as a beggar? The woman stared at him. Just a pence, sir. Why are you here? Where are my brothers, my sisters? Thomas asked. He reached out to her, but she pulled away. Mother, how peculiar you act. You will catch a chill. Here, take my cloak. He removed it and held it out to her. Cautiously, the woman came forward and snatched the coat and retreated into the shadows. But as she moved from the lantern's light, her appearance changed. She was not his mother, but a beggar indeed. With Thomas's cloak in hand, she disappeared into the darkness. A strange trick, he said to himself. He wrapped her, his arms around his chest, wishing he had kept his cloak. It is I who will catch a chill. Thomas walked on, quickening his pace against the frigid air. As he passed beneath the awning of a darkened inn, the candle revealed another form lying in the gutter. He held out the candle and again gasped, Has the universe gone mad? Ellen, my brother, are you sick? He set the lantern down and pulled his brother's limp arm around his shoulder, struggling to lift him. Ellen, I cannot carry you. He pounded on the inn's door, which was opened by a grim-faced woman. My brother is sick, and I feel he will freeze before I can come back for him. Maybe I bring him inside? For the price of a night, a shilling, she crackled. A shilling Thomas reached into his pocket. I have only a sixpence. The woman scowled and began to shut the door. Wait, my snack knapsack is worth more than a shilling, Thomas cried. And the trousers inside are newly tailored, and I will give you everything. The old innkeeper looked at the bundle, then reached out a hand. Thomas flung his knapsack from his back and handed it to her with the last of his money. She opened the door, bring him in. Leaving the lantern on the curb, Thomas dragged the man into the inn's foyer. As he gently laid him down the wooden floor, he suddenly saw that the man's face, like the beggar's, had changed. So it is your brother who layeth in the gutter, croaked the woman. Thomas gasped at the man. He, he is not my brother. Are you mad, the woman muttered, and then shoved him out the door. Outside, Thomas picked up his lantern. He looked into the glass panels. There's something strange about your light, he whispered. Thomas had just glimpsed the bright lights of home when he came across a little girl shivering in the cold. Have you anything to eat, sir, she asked in a faint voice. Thomas felt a stir in his chest. The child was tiny, no bigger than his sister. Suddenly, he pulled the lantern away. He wouldn't shine it on her face. He could guess its trick. And what could he do for this poor Ralph? He had no food or money left to give. I have nothing, Thomas muttered as he left her, willing himself not to turn around. Penniless and cold, Thomas trudged onward hardly glancing at the familiar houses of his childhood. His own home was dressed for the season, and music and laughter came from inside. As he entered the foyer, his mother greeted him with great excitement. Thomas, you have arrived. Hearing her cry, his sisters and brothers rushed into the room to welcome his arrival. With the joy of us, sounds had begun to settle. His mother looked at him peculiar. Thomas, where is your cloak? Yes, said his brother Elwin, and why have you no pack? Thomas gazed suddenly into their bewildered faces. I gave everything away, he said. To whom, his mother asked, puzzled. Thomas looked down at the waning Christmas candle. The old man spoke the truth. You are costly. A smile of understanding slowly spread across his face, but of great worth. What is this riddle? What old man, his sister asked. A wise man who sculpts candles, Thomas replied as he gazed at the face of his sister. And just then, in his mind, the bright face became the woeful, hungry face of the poor child in the cold. 
Thomas looked at the scrumptious banquet lay down on the table. Suddenly, he turned to the door. Thomas, where are you going? I must see about another member of our family, he said. As he left the warm, fragrant house for the cold night, Thomas's heart was warm with joy. For that Christmas Eve, a lesson was learned and taken to heart. If we will see things as they truly are, we will find that all from great to small, beyond, beyond, be, belong, <laughs> I'm sorry y'all, to one family. And the truth known from the beginning of time is perhaps best seen in the joyous illumination of Christmas. Now y'all, I love this. And it says um, in the back of the book, what is the most important thing we can do for our children? And this is the Christmas box foundation. And y'all know we all do the Christmas boxes. And they deliver them to everywhere, just everywhere. Uh, this helps fund the Haven for Neglected Children. Uh, the author's proceeds from this book will go toward the construction of the Christmas House Box. And if you are interested in buying a brick or more information, it is located in Salt Lake City, Utah. And y'all, you know, we all do the Christmas boxes for children all over the world. And uh, I think I have done eight or ten this year. I can't keep up with them. But we have delivered ours, and our church does them. Uh, lots of local churches does them. Our fire departments collect toys for the needy children here, and then we do them for Christian ministries, too. So, you know, please do it with your children. Learn them to give back. Um, it's a wonderful lesson, and one that will take them a long way in life. So, anyway, like I said, I appreciate you listening to me stumbling a little bit here. Um uh, Y'all know what it's like. <laughs> I tell you sometimes, uh, you know, everything's not perfect, but it is meant from the heart. God bless each and every one of you. Sleep with angels every night, and I love you all. Merry Christmas, my darlings.